this podcast is for you if you want to learn about the wonderful and wacky world of the English language and the people who speak it. If you want to learn English, speak English, and understand different speakers of English, then you're in the right place and you're going to love our podcast episode today. Welcome to English World with Chris Americos. We are a team of language lovers, expert teachers, and native speakers who are on a mission to help people around the world speak English and show the world their true value. We correct mistakes, practice pronunciation, and explore grammar rules while drinking coffee and having fun. So get comfortable, relax, grab a pen and paper, and welcome to the show. Today's episode is brought to you by English Every Day, an unlimited speaking practice program where you can join live speaking practice lessons with professional native teachers five times every day. There are a lot of courses on the internet and a lot of useful videos too, but the one thing that is missing for most English learners is practice. And if you need speaking practice, then English Every Day is for you. So click the link in the description or go to chrisamericoast.com to learn more today. Okay, so today we have Gideon with us. And Gideon, how did you get started on YouTube and English? And, you know, tell us a little bit about yourself, you know, quick introduction here. Yeah, hi, Chris. Thanks for inviting me onto your podcast today. I started YouTube, it must have been six or seven years ago. And uh, like many great things in life happened by accident. <laughs> difficult to believe it happened by accident but uh, I was teaching English in Paris uh, I, before that I was working in IT <laughs> we'll, we'll go into that another time uh, but I was teaching English in Paris and I had a website but not much content and I wanted to get so it was, I, was, I was into being to SEO because I worked in you know uh, IT in bit of web design and I knew a little bit about SEO I thought well maybe this thing called YouTube maybe I can make a, a video too and attract some new customers and get some content for my website so I made a couple of videos and I really never imagined that I'd make any more and then a few I, I never imagined anyone outside of Paris would even watch it or anyone I thought only would find it on my uh, website so I made a few more and I started to get engagement from people you know people in wherever in Saudi Arabia or in South America I thought, well, what are these people watching the video okay maybe I'll make another one and that's how I got started so it was never a process I never woke up one morning and thought hmm, today I'm going to make you become a YouTuber <laughs> I still don't like the term a YouTuber but you know what I mean I, I, Me neither, you know, but... it was a conscious decision to uh yeah, yeah. You know, that's a common story that I think we're hearing from a lot of people. It's like, I just wanted to make a video, and then that turned into five videos. And then that turned into, people said they liked it, so five more videos, and then five yeah. years. <laughs> and it gets a bit addictive because of the engagement, I think. Also, you would like learning the process. Each time you make a video, you try and make it a little bit better than the last time. And you yeah. think, oh, I did that. I could have. Why did I do it like that? I could make it a little bit better next time. Yeah, and and also the engagement. So so those two forces drive you on. I think you you've had a similar experience, but really the engagement, uh, you know, mostly positive. <laughs> you know, there's always a few uh, a few people who um, think uh, you're yeah, doing things the wrong way. Whatever you do, how do you deal with that? The over time, I've learned. Just ignore it. The best ways to ignore it. What would you think? Do you agree with that? Yeah. Yeah. It shouldn't stop anyone, I think. Uh, you should expect it. You should welcome it. Yeah, yeah. Embrace it. Exactly. I think at the beginning, I would reply to the haters, but someone would write a wonderful, lovely comment, complimentary comment, and I would be more like, those, you know, you, you, there comes a time where it's difficult to reply to all the comments, you know. Uh, where I reply to the, the hater, saying, no, you know, I used to, you know, um, <laughs> in a hateful way myself, though, but not to the complimentary thing. So, so no, ignore these people and just reply to the, the people who, 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 who like you. It's interesting you brought that up because I've seen that on some channels, they will only reply to people who critique them criticize them yeah and yeah 
it's interesting uh, why that is. I think it's something guttural, something you know visceral. We, we want to uh, uh, get our own back. But I, sh I should say that I don't mind. I'm happy with with uh, criticism. I can take criticism because uh, so, I make mistakes. You know, in YouTube, it's, it's so some genuine feedback. I'm happy with that. And I don't even criticism, except really nasty ones. I usually I leave it on the channel. I don't delete it. I think it's so that everything is positive when you read the comments. If you read the comments on my videos, I leave in most comments, even if they're negative. I don't like them to delete it. I'm not, you know, it's, uh, censoring things. Just some things, which, some things I delete if they're really nasty, they would upset the, the other readers of the comments. Yeah, type of things, anything like really racist or yeah, um, you don't want to make it know. like a hateful platform. Exactly, exactly. So that's the exception. Yeah, I had to delete one of those. Really nasty, you, you too. <laughs> I had to delete one of those yesterday. Yeah, really. I Someone went... going off on a racist rant in my comments. I'm just like, what is this about? You know, it's unbelievable. Yeah, and you feel like you want to engage. There's only a bit you, <laughs> but you fit something. You want to engage with these people, but don't. I think. Actually, you know, from the like marketing point of view, I want to leave it, but I don't yeah. because right. more comment, right. more engagement, it's better for the yeah, <laughs> yeah I guess so, yeah. the reach, right? Yeah, which yeah. is kind of uh, one of the things I think a lot of people are dealing with with um, with social media today is that by saying controversial things, you can get people's attention. And that attention is worth a lot of, of money, power, influence. So yeah. the huge figures around the world just saying that all kinds of stuff and and it gets them attention. So they stay relevant, right? Well, there's a famous quote. I don't know if it's from like, if you want attention, start a fight. So coming back to you, how did you find yourself living in France? What would ever possess you to do such a thing? <laughs> You've obviously been to France, so you know it well. But uh, uh, no, again, again, it was, an, I believe it or not, it was also an accident. I, I used to work in IT and I was doing it for many years. My first job, actually, my first job was teaching English. When I finished university, I went to Spain, I went to Madrid. I stayed there for a couple of years. But at that time, focus was on, you know, living abroad, learning Spanish, you know, having a good time. It wasn't really, I'm going to be an English teacher. But I came back to England and I, I changed my uh, job. I worked in IT. I was a programmer, a developer, did some stuff on the internet. And I came to, and then I was working on contracts. My work came to an end. And I thought, well, I got a bit of free time. I was, why don't I just go to Paris? I always wanted to spend a bit of time in Paris and learn a little bit of French. So I, I got myself a, you're a star ticket. That's a train that goes from Paris to London to Paris, if you're not familiar, or Paris to London, if you go the other way. And uh, yeah, I hopped on. I thought, well, I'll stay here for a month or two. That'd be cool. And, uh, and then the, the job that I just left, I said, oh, we, we need you back now. We haven't finished. It's, 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 so well, now I'm, I'm in Paris now. Goes, well, it's all right. You can work online. And you can carry on doing some stuff and come over occasionally every couple of weeks. Okay. I did that. So I stayed in Paris. And then uh, that work came to an end. And then I was kind of settled in Paris. I said, what am I going to do? Right? I'll teach a bit of a few English lessons. I used to do that. And it went really well. I surprised you. I set up in my, in my little apartment. So I've got a tiny apartment in the center of Paris. And lots of people coming. So I set up another one, another one, another one. And then, um, well... There you are, the rest is history. You are so all by accident. I never decided to come to Paris. I never uh, decided to be really an English teacher so much. I never decided to, to I never chose to run a YouTube channel. Yeah. It just happened that way. All you I'm sure you know all good things, coincidence. Take what you have gathered from coincidence. That's what Bob Dylan says. So I, I follow that uh, mantra. Yeah. So I think a lot of people assume that because England and France are so close, even connected, and you can so easily 
move between them, uh, that the two cultures are very similar, that that people in France probably speak great English. Is that the case? That's a very sort of a, a Mero-centric <laughs> statement, uh, Chris. I was actually trying to take like the position of someone who who maybe lives like in China or Russia, who is equally as far from these two <laughs> as the United States, because I think that uh, overall people are more familiar with geography that is close to them. You know, like uh, a Russian person asks an American person where Kazakhstan is, and they don't know, even though it's a huge country. And yeah. American person asks a Russian person where Belize is or Nicaragua, and they're like, they don't know because it's so far away and they have never thought about going there, right? It's true, but it did uh, reflect uh, a different worldview. And I like, like Americans, I think they think nothing is, well, we're going to get some tacos now. Well, where is it? It's like three hours' drive. If you're European, <laughs> You say three hours to get some tacos, and you know, but you say, well, it's not that far. It's really good, really good tacos. Three and hours. Europe, you get across Europe, and you get you get, you'll end up in Africa if you if you drive for three hours. We're not from not from London. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, no, but we remember that Britain is an island. Yeah, and so we are separated by a little piece of water. Uh, so not that close and if you fly for two hours from london you could you could go to spain or 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 fly over france or germany or the netherlands or even eastern europe so we're close to everything in in sort of for american uh, (laughs) perspective everything's close it's true Uh, if you're in london uh, a little bit yeah because uh, london and paris are connected now by train and in in London, certainly, you'd probably learn French at school. Not always, even when I was in school, it was French. But if you're in, in Scotland, London, France is quite far away. So, well, you know. Yeah. So, it's just, so, but, yeah, so, and I think, yeah, Paris and London have much, uh, quite a lot in common, both the big cosmopolitan cities. And so there are some things, yeah, they do connect (laughs) how would you say that uh the overall level of english is in france or in paris the french underestimate their abilities because it's improved a lot it's improved i must say it's really improved even since i've been here i've been here about 15 years and when i came you, you could still meet remember that as you said like london is like two hours 20 minutes on the train but you could still meet people in their 18, 20 year olds who didn't know a word of English. Mm-hmm. They could say hello. And uh, yes, uh, and a few cliches. So they don't speak English, so they say something like, uh, my tailor is rich, Brian is in the kitchen. Those are the, the two like phrases that they they learn. And they could say, I speak English, yes. Uh, Brian is in the kitchen. But, but now, you occasionally you do it, but but now you find I think the level has gone up considerably because most young people just thought they can get by. Mm-hmm. Maybe not great level, but they can communicate. Yeah. So there's a there's a generational gap, like in most other places. Yeah, and I think French maybe the gap is more recent because I think until recently. The assumption was, well, we're French, you know, we can go anywhere and speak our language because everyone speaks French. And then someone told them, well, you know what, I just went abroad and it's not the case anymore, really. So, <laughs> so, so somebody in the education system changed, uh, changed the rules. So they're getting better, yeah. Okay. So when did you decide to open a physical language center in Paris? Uh, again, I, it was... I was teaching a few classes from my school, from my home. Right, right. And which, when I say at home, you know, I'm I'm European, living in Europe in Paris. I have, no. I have oh, thirty, God. I have, I have thirty five square meters. That's that's my the size of my apartment. I have two rooms, thirty five square meters. That, um, that's that's not bad. That's a good apartment. Really? Compared yeah. to, I mean, uh, you know. When, when we started our school in Russia, I was living in like a 17 square meter. No way. Were you teaching from there? 
<laughs> I've made some videos from there. Yeah. Oh, really? Okay. But uh, okay. No, we had an office. We we really? okay. Yeah. But so when did you make that shift from apartment teaching to office teaching? Uh, after a couple of years, we just had more and more lessons at my home, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, we decided to. Uh, search for something it's very expensive paris is, is, is very expensive for office space so it was it's it's tough you need a lot of uh, uh, a lot of students but we managed it and we were downgraded since covid we actually have quite a big school before but since covid we now uh, we've got one and a half rooms we've got one hour which is ours all the time and another one which we share with somebody else so yeah. sort of downgraded because a lot more is online now Loves to a lot of their businesses. Oh, when here. you first set it up, I can just imagine, you know, my experience setting up a, a school, a business in in Russia. Mm -hmm. Was there a lot of red tape or hurdles that you had to jump over when Abs you were doing? Absolutely, I can't compare it to Russia. I I've, I've, I've heard uh, nightmare stories on the on the great one about about Russia, uh, so I can't compare. But in France, there's a lot of administration. A lot. I compare it to Britain because in Britain you can set up a company in like an hour, and yeah. it costs like well, it could be free, but if you could pay somebody, it'd be like thirty pounds, right? Like Forty dollars, dollars, whatever that is. Uh, but I think it's a bit easier now. But when I set up in France, it can take weeks to set up a company, and you need stamps, and yeah. you need and yeah, and it, it's it's a really long process. So. The stamps, um, the stamps. I remember all the stamps. Oh yeah, <laughs> I think we uh, will discuss that. I, I, I imagine Russia's I, I, famous for its um, um, bureaucracy and red tape as well. I, uh, yeah, uh, the first time we did it, because I I set up two different companies when I was over there. Right. The first time we did it, we just didn't know anything, and okay. I was like, I was basically like, I've done this before in the united states but i'm not exactly sure how it's going to work and so i just have yeah. like an idea of how it's supposed to work in the united states and i'm telling my then girlfriend now wife slash yeah, business yeah. partner at the time okay. she i'm telling her like i think it's supposed to be like this go learn about this thing and so it was kind of and she's a, it, like a university student at the time so i'm like yeah uh, go yeah. learn this thing about how it's supposed to work in Russia. Because I think really. this, but it, so it should be something like this. Just go look for something like that. That that's kind of how we started it. And then we uh -huh. found some lawyers. They didn't. Oh, know you had to get the lawyers involved. Well, we found just some like a, a small legal firm that helped set up businesses, uh, but okay. they had no experience dealing with foreigners, mm -hmm. and so they ended up making me the director of the company mm -hmm. so then my partner got a call like a few weeks later from the fsb like the oh yeah 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 I, 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 service I saying like you need to come in and meet us she she goes to meet them and they're like why is this guy the director <laughs> if he's the director he's supposed to have a special director's visa and he's not allowed to be another kind of employee he's only allowed to be the director and there's special rules for that. And so like, we didn't know that the, there's no way for me to know that. And the lawyers who set it up clearly didn't know that. And in the end, everything was okay. Uh, but yeah, there was that thing. And then like getting, a, getting a visa to have a foreign uh -huh. teacher teach there, it was such like a mess is such a battle. Uh, every single time. So, you know, when I first went to Russia, I was working in another school and I really mm -hmm. hate how it felt like they were holding your visa hostage. Cause basically if you didn't comply uh, with what your employer uh, did, well, they can just say, Hey, we don't need this guy anymore. Boom. Now you need to leave the country. So like that system creates this kind of relationship where okay. it feels like the employer is like holding you hostage, you know? Oh, and uh, and so I know a lot of other like most of the European countries have more like kind of porous borders <laughs> when it comes to that, you know. Yeah. 
It's uh, so interesting what you say, but it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's quite bureaucratic in, in France, but nothing like that. I mean, the, the, the only problem I had was like, you needed a bank account in order to set up a, a company and mm -hmm. you have a man, you have a, a meeting and they can veto what you're doing. So they can't do that in Britain. You, you know, they, they can't tell you what you could have been. One bank manager said to me, she said, I, the only time I lost my temper in the whole thing, she, she looked at my business plan and says, no, no, I can't see what you're trying to do here. No, no. I said, it's, it's a, I sort of swore that, right? <laughs> it's, it's a language school. What is it that you don't understand? Said, no, 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 no. And we can't write it. <laughs> The funniest part for me was giving myself uh, like a, a work visa. So I, okay. I need to issue oh, I see. I, from, from the company, I need to yeah. issue a work visa for myself to hire myself to work in my company so that I can get into Russia, like back and forth, right? I have to have a That's special. That's insane. <laughs> so that was interesting. It's like, oh, I need to renew my my visa to Russia, I'll just... So you sign it and your name's on the top as well. The, the well, I technically and... couldn't be the director. Okay. So my wife, girlfriend, partner had to do that. I recently was watching a video and you were talking about different versions of Harry Potter. Sorry, uh, Chris, you mean Harry Potter? <laughs> Harry Potter. <laughs> you do it very well. <laughs> You've got good, uh, good accent. <laughs> very well. Okay, carry on. Yes. Uh, yeah. Just tell us a little bit more about this because I had never heard about this. I think that people will be interested to hear this. So, why did they do that? And like, is it really different? No, it's not that different. No, this is the book. The books, uh, by the way. Yes, the the first. I don't know if all the books. I think all the books. But the first book. Uh, it was called Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, uh -huh. but American viewers were going, no, it's not. It's with an American accent. Said, no, it's not. It's called Harry Potter, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. Ah. But what the, the name was changed for the marketing, I think, because philosopher doesn't sound a bit, a bit cool. So, but there are lots of words in British English, because I think uh, J.K. Rowling, she never imagined it would take off globally. So she just wrote it in you know, British English, as you would expect her to do. So she used uh, lots of British expressions and uh, to American kids, because it's a, a, a book for, for children, as it was supposed to be, uh, they would be unfamiliar. Yeah, with, that's I love these terms. I, I did a few in this video, and one, I got a lot of, uh, pushback because I said um, wardrobe. It's not my. It's not me who made the decision. Cupboard was mm -hmm. changed in American English to closet, mm -hmm. and the the haters came into the channel. Goes no, we use cupboard too in American English. No, what are you talking about, you idiot? You don't know what you're talking about. It, by the way, it wasn't me. It was J.K. Rowling. <laughs> but well, they didn't realize that, like a cupboard in British English, can also be like a little room. I think not. I think I'm not an expert in American English. But I think it's like the the cupboard under the stairs or the broom cupboard. It's a room. It's not just a little standalone. Right. Thing. Okay. I see the confusion. Yeah, we would call it a broom closet. Yeah, broom yeah. closet. We call it broom cupboard. So yeah. it was completely correct, the translation. They, if you needed to translate it, but I don't know, you still get people who've got you know, nothing better to do than just to read, right? <laughs> but that. I think Harry Potter kind of popular, popularized those rooms. You know, <laughs> yeah. when, when we got our first place, we had one of those little, like there was a little tiny door that went into a little storage space, right? And so my wife would always call it the Harry Potter room. Ah, nice. And it was right under the stairs. And so now when people see that, they're just like, oh, Harry Potter room. Yeah, it's interesting about cupboard. I've thought about this a lot because we use cupboard in American English, but just not as widely as British English. Yeah, English. exactly. That's exactly. Like a cupboard in American English is more directly related to like cups, 
So it's usually in the kitchen. It's usually high on the wall so that you reach it while you're standing or, yeah. or something like this, right? So um, and cups, it, it because it's got a cup board, so it's placed for the cups. It's a kind of a logical thing, really, isn't it? Right. You're so using it correctly. But they might also call it kitchen cabinets. Okay. Kitchen okay. cabinets, kitchen cupboards. Yeah. Yeah, probably cupboard is like not the choice, the word that American speakers yeah. choose more often, right? And then in, in, in the kitchen, for example, we have a like, like a big room to keep things. Uh-huh. We call it a pantry. The pantry. Yes, uh -huh. I've heard that expression. I think it's an old, uh, I think maybe we would use it. Uh, in olden times, I don't think it's in modern English, British. It's English interesting, English. right? How American English chose to keep some old things that yeah. lost. And... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and you get again, you get these 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 I don't know stuck up Brits occasionally sort of turn their nose up to American English. Just, oh, no, no, I would never use the word trash. It's so American. It's so oh no, it is, please use rubbish. But actually, trash is a, a British word, and Shakespeare used it several times. And it actually comes from uh, Old Norse, the the, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the, the Vikings uh, use. It comes from tross, which means uh, uh, sticks that are picked up from the forest or something like that. Wow. So it goes back uh, more, more than a, a thousand years, but yeah, people just can't stand it if it sounds American, which is ridiculous. <laughs> That's you get the other way around. You, I think you told me in an email that you get other people saying, no, American English. No, British English is the only one. Or, or Ameri yeah. I, I get the reverse, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They say to me, American <clears throat> English isn't English, so you don't teach English, right? Like I'll be running an advertisement saying like, yeah. learn, to, learn English, speak English. And people are, and British teachers are commenting like, that's not English. No. <laughs> what, what do they want? Do they want everyone? Like how many, I don't know, 400 million native English speakers. I got the right number. Do they want everyone to speak with the same accent, with the same vocabulary? Is that really what they want? Is that really interesting? Would that well, be the better is. way to we all speak exactly the same, like robots? Is that the but better it, way? It is the country of England, mm -hmm. the language of English. I mean, I can understand why people would think that if it's a centralized language, it should be centralized in England. It should be about why it's that's the source, right? And a lot of people, I think, globally kind of think that too. They think England, source of English language, just like you would say the same about France. France, source of French language, although plenty of other countries speak variations and their versions of French, yeah. right? Uh, I understand why it's called English because it originated in England. Fair enough. But that doesn't sort of um, devalidate, is that the word, <laughs> the, the other forms of, of English. It just means, well, that's where the origins are. The other ones are equally valid, equally good. There's no one better than another. It depends on the individual. It's always the individual that counts. Right. But if we took like an example that's unrealistic in our current global situation, right? So let's imagine, for example, Thai. Mm -hmm. uh, Let's say, you know, a bunch of Thai speakers have been living in New York for a hundred years and they speak differently than people in Thailand. So mm -hmm. is there Thai, like, do you start to say that this is just a new type of Thai because they've lived in this place for so long and started speaking differently? Or do you still say like, well, there's this thing called Thai that is different in Thailand that's officially regulated or officially officially guided. And then there's these other people. So, so I think sometimes it's hard to draw that line, like where is a valid variation of a language and where is it not valid, right? Okay. But you have a, like, even in America, you have um, the Spanglish, don't you? So all these Spanish speakers in America who, who kind of mix Spanish and English yeah. and it's, almost considered a different language or a variant of Spanish rather than a variant of English. Uh, <laughs> but it's still, I don't know, we can't fight against it. That's how people speak. We can't sort of uh, legislate. So, no, you're not allowed to speak like that. No, no we just have to. But there are forces speak? that kind of uh, legislate <laughs> or guide this process. And that's 
you know, France is like the biggest example of this, right? Where they basically said that the English language was encroaching and that they had to set rules and boundaries. Uh, okay, well, I'll, I'll come to the French language because they have an, an academy, the Academy Francaise, which is just not far from here, pointing in that direction. There's a big uh, uh, building with a golden dome where the members of the academy once that they sit and they decide what goes into the language what doesn't it doesn't really work especially with english because the people are speaking one way and the academy is saying something else like for example in english we have a word email okay yeah fair enough that's easy enough it's email which was come from American English, by the way, because I guess in British English, if, if we'd invented the internet, it would have been e-post. We <laughs> <laughs> get the post, but, um, but it's email. Uh, but in American English, they got like, okay, they started off of like, oh, email. Oh, some people still using email. Then they go, no, no, we've got to have a French version. That's not, because that's English. Uh, courriel. And they give it courier, no, we call it yeah, uh-huh. courier. But some people start using, continue using email, but they drop the E, so they say mail. But it can't be spelled M-A-I-L because that would be my. So they start saying, no, you, you're going to spell it M-E with an accent, L, mail. Okay, so you've got people writing. Sometimes I receive emails with, with courriel, with email, with mail, M-A-I-L, or M-E-L. So it's, for, it's just going crazy just because they're trying to control the language. And finally, on this point, they say, no, we don't want this Anglo, so-called Anglo-Saxon influence with the word email. But did you know that um, mail itself is a French word? <laughs> Originally, it comes from, um, mail comes from uh, um Mal is it in French? I can't remember my French, which means a, 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 like a trunk, you know, a big, big suitcase, a trunk. That's what it means in French. So actually the word is actually French in the first place. So why are you building these, these complex rules that nobody can follow? It makes no <laughs> sense at all. Well, when you were saying the French word for email, it sounds very similar to the Spanish word. And, and it's interesting that they both have that root of the verb to run. Yeah. Something like this. Electronic running. Yeah. And and so, you know, like it's all the way back from Latin and 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 this root, right? Like cour, cour, this was about running. And uh yeah. In English even took it like courier, yeah. right? Yeah. But well, I think uh, when you try to legislate for language, I think you're you're just you're on a hiding to nothing, you know, it's gonna come out badly. You think so? You think yeah, it's mostly, yeah. Wrong. I think I understand like the spelling and thing. The spelling changes over time. It'd be good if English had a more like a, a logical way of spelling. I'm all in favor of spelling reform, but you can't tell people what words to use and what words not to use. Well, if we think about like how language is controlled in different countries, right? The the United States does like it has some academy or institution that kind of leads this but at the end of the day which it, one i mean there I'm there not, there's not like a central one like right, okay okay centralized. Uh, i believe in the uk there is a central body no 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 you have the uh oxford. you have influences you, that's okay. you, you have oxford diction will influence things but they don't have the final words there's the the, the people decide in the end but the Oxford Dictionary will uh, look at what's being said, and then we'll, it'll go into the dictionary or not. Mm-hmm. But they'll never prescribe, you know, this one you have to say, this one you can't say. So French is different in that aspect, where they French, have a yeah. central body, and a lot of other countries have that too. Mm-hmm. Uh, they feel like the language is something yeah. that be defended, protected, standardized. Yeah. And to me, it's really it, like sharing my experience from Russia again. It was just so amazing that this vast territory has less variation in the you know primary language 
of, of Russian than so many other countries. Like in, I lived in Italy, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Sicily. And so if we went to any other part of Italy, people spoke differently. And, and like, I couldn't even understand regional dialects or anything like that. Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Completely different from standard Italian. And, um, in Russia, you can go thousands of miles and people more or less are speaking the same way. Well, like, why, why is that then? Why is that? I think it's because of the standardization of the language that okay. uh, it's maybe it's not about rules and governing bodies as much as it is how it's implemented through the education system and and other methods, you know? The stereotype for Americans about going to France is that French people are going to say, even if they understand what you say to them in English, that they're going to say, speak French. You're in France. Speak <laughs> French. And so I, this is what I heard from other people like growing up, right? But it's kind of like the same idea, like how frequently or or how acceptable would it be in English for you to just have a normal conversation with someone and for someone to say that you, to correct your grammar, to say you made a mistake, uh, to say okay. a word okay. or something like this between native speakers. So in English, that would be considered rude. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but in some other languages, it's just, hey, you were wrong. I corrected you. Uh, that's interesting. Right? That's and so the, yeah. like, the culture of error correction is built into the language and it's not seen as being rude but being helpful and you you know what i mean so uh, yeah that, i mean the only time you'd correct someone i you you agree with me in, in english if maybe your colleague is writing an email and it's supposed to be in very formal english and it's not they've written very colloquially and you might say no no it's better if you do it like this but when they're you're having a conversation it would be rude to correct somebody's even though sometimes you want to yeah <laughs> and uh, you have to like bite your tongue yeah. yeah i mean but then if we look at some other languages like japanese for example super complicated language and the systems and and the language is you know guided by the central like the central body you know mm. so i think that having that centralized a centralized language it gives you more standardization but less reach maybe i uh, maybe yeah i would compare like french but a lot of it is history as well because it, um french they do have different accents yeah yeah really absolutely. But not nothing compared to um, Britain. Nothing compared to Britain. And Britain, you go over like fifty miles, and it's a completely different accent. You know, you go from Liverpool to Manchester, it's thirty-five miles, completely really different. Then you go to Leeds. But they're, and those yeah. are just accents, not dialects. <clears throat> well, it depends on your definition, anyway. But well, but but in France, the reason is there aren't so many is because um, the time of the French Revolution, only about you know. 15% of the population actually spoke French. Like the, the idea of like everyone speaking French is relatively recent before, you know, that Occitan in the South, you'd have Breton in the North and you'd have other, uh, you'd have uh, Basque and Catalan and all the different languages. So in the end, right. they all learn French. So it's, yeah, accents were not that different not compared to, to um Britain. And so that's your earlier question, difference between a, an accent and a dialect. Uh, I think dialects have more sort of maybe grammatical differences. It's not just a bit of pronunciation, but where you draw the line, it's, you know, people draw the line differently. Yeah. I, I mean, for example, like when I was living in Italy, again, if you go to Naples, there's Neapolitan and there are different words and there's different mm. verbs and there's different and so it's really different like people <clears throat> from places won't understand and but, but it, it used to be they used to be different languages though because uh, italy was only united in the 19th century so they used to be considered different languages, didn't they yeah yeah exactly 
so they might so people might keep a lot of that and then blend it in with standard Italian. And then when they go to a shop, when they go to somewhere formal, public, then speak more of school Italian. Right. All right. I understand. Uh, so that was really interesting to see. And then, you know, like even Spanish, if you Spanish also had, you know, grew in a very interesting way. Cause I, today it's interesting to like look at the globe and say, okay, who speaks what after, you know, uh, imperialism more or less has is in his final chapters. Uh, yeah, sure. Africa, it's just kind of a mess of all different like past power languages, local languages, and but South America is predominantly Spanish speaking, Central mm -hmm. America Spanish speaking, and then they have their own little differences between them too. Although English is this global language, French, Spanish, they're being used as global languages too. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Uh, French is interesting because you know what? The, the I think Paris is the biggest French-speaking city in the world still, but second is uh, Kinshasa. There used to be Montreal, uh, but now so a lot of so although French left, lost a lot of its global reach. In Europe and 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 globally, the, the opposite is true in many ways. Because in Africa, which have you know, fast growing populations, um, that's where the, the French is. So yeah, in, in uh, yeah. Congo and uh, and like Congo that. Kinshasa yeah. is yeah. is on the list to I think hit one of the like become one of the top ten populations. Yeah, I yeah. believe. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's just going to explode. And it's all French speakers. I mean, in Africa, there are so many French speaking countries. So I had a question coming Go back ahead. to the topic of uh, British and American English. You know, I know this word. I think I know this word, but maybe I don't know this word. What is quid? Okay. I use it. How, what are other words that you can use to say that? Quid. Well, you know, in American, you have uh, dollars, and you might call them uh, uh, a buck. buck. Yeah, buck. It's one buck, two bucks. In in Britain, you have the equivalent is quid. The only difference is that it never has an s. Okay. So fifty quid. Can you lend me fifty quid until payday? Now, would you ever say one quid? Yeah, sure. A quid. Yeah, a absolutely. Quid. Yeah, but it's, it's just unchanged, like sheep. One sheep, two sheep. It's just, it's just not changeable. You, you can know, count five them quid. Go to sleep. Exactly, you count quid. One quid, two quid. Uh, exactly. So that, that's all it means. It's just, it's just the the equivalent. I don't know, it has some sort of Latin history. Uh, I think quid and uh, uh -huh. ah, like quid pro quo. Exactly. Exactly. I think is the connection with that. Uh, this and that. So cool. Okay. I th I was thinking that it was going to be more different. Uh, maybe there are some other money slang. There are use, but yeah, if you if you um if you come to London, there are no Cockney, then um, a monkey. That's five hundred pounds. Uh, five hundred quid. A pony. What's a pony? Twenty five pounds. Yeah, so not are everyone they, uses that. You use it for cubic effect. On, are these images like on the paper or coin? No, no, no. I, actually, I don't know the origin. Why called five hundred quid a monkey? So uh, I think it's. I don't know. I don't know why they say monkey. Well, I guess it's the same with us, right? There's not a buck on on a buck. There's an <laughs> no. there's an eagle. Why don't we call them eagles? No, it's of true. Bucks? <laughs> but you you have some interesting. Terms for for American money, don't you? A a, a Benjamin or what is it? Uh, uh, <laughs> that's the that, that's the person's face. So whoever is on the money, you can use their name. Oh, I see. Oh, I see. Oh, well, we, we don't have, have that. We don't have the Florence Nightingale. No. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a Nightingale. Give me a Nightingale. No, no one would understand that. But why not? Uh, so Benjamin is is what I don't remember on the that's on 100. The, that's a hundred. That's a hundo. That's a hundo. Hundy. Handy, okay. But could I say, wait, wait, Chris, give me free, free Benjamins until 
Hey, yeah. I'm a bit pro. Three Benjis right here. Three Benjis. Okay. <laughs> so I can say half a monkey. You can say half a monkey. Give me, give me half a monkey. Half a monkey. Okay. Only in London, I think they might understand. That's what I. Two hundred fifty pounds. Two hundred fifty. Two hundred fifty pounds. Yeah. Oh, for half a monkey. Right. Right. Yeah. So if I want to buy something for a hundred, I can say a fifth of a monkey. <laughs> <laughs> No, no. A fifth of monkey. A uh, hundred. What's a hundred? Is that a ton? I think it's called a ton. I'm a ton. Sure. A ton. Really, that would confuse me because a ton is a thousand pounds in weight. Yeah. Now I'm getting confused myself. I think <laughs> Nif- a nifty fifty. I haven't been to London a long time. I think. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's so many different slang words depending on which groups of people you're talking to. They make up all kinds of crazy stuff, yeah. right? Oh, yeah, knicker. You also hear knicker for pounds sometimes. Knicker? Knicker, yeah, 50 knickers. Knicker is also a I think. For a pound? Yeah, yeah. 50 knickers, 50 pounds. I think it's something to do with nickel or something. Yeah. Uh-huh. Not, it doesn't have anything to do with underpants? No, you think so, but no. <laughs> I think it's something to do with nickel. Uh-huh. Uh, the or- origin, yeah. Because the origin of pounds... It's called the pounds because it was the a pound of silver. Uh huh. So one pound cost a, one pound of silver, one pound. Yeah, in weight. It was oh, I don't know what I'm talking about now, but you know, <laughs> I mean, there's some connection with with silver and a pound of silver and a. And a and I wonder if pound. you know if it might be confusing to go to a lingerie store and. <laughs> You go to pay and say, how much? And they say, 50 knickers. And you say, no, just one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, try it. And only, my fleet and um, live stream as well. I like to see the, <laughs> how, how it goes. Victoria's Secret. Good video. Yeah, yeah. You, that, that'll, that'll go viral, Chris. So you, <laughs> do, Chris do and Coast buying knickers. <laughs> exactly. Buying knickers with knickers. So uh, coming back to YouTube, how would you describe kind of the current state of the YouTube teaching, English teaching community, or like the English teaching community as a whole online? You know, there's good, there's bad. What's your opinion? Um, Well, mine's good, of course, you know. (laughs) Uh, It's a a wonderful thing, though, isn't it, in general, because when I was, you know, a long time ago, I didn't try to learn a language, didn't have this, this wonderful resource of uh, youtube yeah so i i I can't speak for the i'm sure there are there are bad ones too but you see so many great teachers i've been over time i've been learning uh uh, japanese and um italian and stuff and it's just so great instead of starting from books you can hear people speaking do some people it's, it's it's a wonderful thing it's great and I know from my, my channel that uh, I teach in Paris, but the people who come here are kind of privileged in a way because they can afford to buy lessons. But not everyone's in that situation. Some people rely on YouTube. You've probably found this, this for for their learning. They've got some books and they've got YouTube, and that's how they that's how they learn. And that they might not have the resources to go to a language school every day, every week, something. So it's it's really good. Yeah, uh, I, I can't speak for all the, the channels, but I've seen some great channels in English, yours included, Chris. Oh, thank wonderful, you. Ch- wonderful channel. Okay. Uh, but, uh, but there are some really great channels out there. And uh, yeah, what do you think? You agree? I agree. I agree. There's, I think anything you look at, you can find good and bad, especially if you're trying. Um, but yeah, yeah, definitely, uh, of course. But I guess where I was going with that is, you know, it's hard sometimes to draw the line between education, entertainment, and business. And they all collide on YouTube. And so where would you draw the line? I I do education. Okay. I Uh I do with my, maybe my personality comes across and I hope the videos that I make are are entertaining uh, and instructive but I don't go out to make an entertainment. The only once or twice I try to do that, and it was I got about like three views and uh, lots of 
you know, dislike. So I don't, <laughs> I just try to make educational videos and I hope that people find them entertaining as well. Because people, at the end of the day, people aren't going to watch an English grammar video for entertainment. I don't think many people, they're going to, that's a sort of a, by, a bonus. Uh, they'll, they'll go on to on some streaming service for that. But uh, yeah, business. I wish I could answer that question because I'm not really, <laughs> I need to, I keep being told that I have to sort of monetize my, which I'm doing when I'm looking into sort of doing some courses and things, uh, but I'm I'm not really equipped. I think you are better equipped than me to answer the the question about. Well, I mean, at the beginning of our of our talk, you described how basically you started a business out of your apartment. You yeah. started lessons, then yeah. you know, grew from there, and that reaching people was one of your main goals. So I would mm -hmm. say that you started your YouTube channel with a business goal in mind. And so for you, it was from the beginning, a business platform, even if, even if like the content that you put out is educational. So like a lot of times we'll see content creators, uh, teachers just straight up promote a course or mm -hmm. lessons with me or whatever. And so that has very little educational value, high business value, but like, where do we even draw the line? Because should teachers sell things at all? And should teacher, like if you go to TikTok, do you need mm -hmm, to do mm -hmm. a fluency dance? Like, are you gonna, <laughs> you, you know what I mean? So like, where's the line? That's, that's a very interesting question. I remember like uh, when I started, there were, there were a lot of, um, I would say English teachers who, who would make one video that they put on YouTube where they just, in, it was kind of like a CV. I don't yeah. think they exist so much. It's like, uh, hi, my name's John Smith. I've got 35 years experience teaching English. I've taught in very, very different countries, taught children and adults and in the, in the space industry, whatever. And uh, if you want more information, contact me now. Uh, <laughs> and that never appealed to me. You I still, still see those, those from uh, from teacher applicants. Yeah, they. Okay. I'll be like, show me a video of yourself speaking English or something, and they'll send me to a YouTube where a YouTube video where it's just you know for employers <laughs> who are going to hire. Yeah, but I I think really, it's it's better for all parties. You actually teach something, <laughs> actually teach something. And then, of course, you, it's a platform for business. I agree with you. Absolutely. I'm not, no problem with that. People are going to use it for business. Of course, everyone is. I, I, at some later stage, I plan to more. But, yeah, teach something. Get the, 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 someone to learn. And then at the end, you can say, by the way, did you know? Do you know you want some more information? You want, to, you want me to be a teacher? Contact me here. That's much better, isn't it? For yeah. an employer as well to see that from a uh, from a potential candidate, I think that's much yeah. more interesting. Give before you take. Give, Give before you yeah, take. yeah, absolutely, yeah. Give before you take, yeah, because that 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 uh, CV thing is just it's all about taking. It's all about me. Yeah, you offer something before you take. Yeah, absolutely, I agree. So you know, Gideon, even though you are so humble. You <laughs> You've achieved a lot. Like your YouTube channel has over 500,000 subscribers. That's just unimaginable for the majority of people out there. And you started a teaching business from your apartment and moved that online, grew that into, you know, a regular income for yourself. Mm -hmm. People are trying to do that every day and it's not working. And so, you know, what two things, if you could give like two secrets, two clues piece of advice that you know people would need to follow in order to get to where you are or you think things that would help them get to where you are or maybe things to avoid okay but by the way i mean it hasn't been so always uh, run so smoothly i should say so i i'm not sure that, i will answer your question i promise i will answer your question yeah. but it's not always been um I do uh, rainbows and unicorns, as they say. Uh, but for uh, two different things, if you're making YouTube videos, I think be authentic. Because uh, what 
I know the temptation is always there. You see another YouTube video which has made, uh, which has got 10 million trillion views. And you thought, oh, oh, I, I should make one similar. I can also get a million trillion views. I think that never works yeah, because if, if it goes against what you're really into, yeah, yeah, 100 ways to say happy birthday. Oh, I got, a, I got 10 million views. Oh, but I know 101 ways to say happy birthday. <laughs> make a better video. I'm going to become rich and famous. Uh, no, just be authentic. And, uh, you know, I'm interested in, always in grammar and uh, I've got an interest in the history of language. So I'm just following those things. And if, and if you really enjoy it, probably someone out there is going to have the same passion as well. So I would say the authenticity is one. And I can't remember the second part of your question. <laughs> Chris, uh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Listen to listen to uh, to people when they ask questions. <laughs> something something else that they might need to avoid, or that might be helpful helpful for them to get to where you are. Avoid, uh, I would say, just avoid the pressure to make. I know videos every. I remember when I was trying to improve my content, so make videos every every week, every day, uh, and uh, do it like this or like this. Uh, I say to avoid the pressure, do what you feel comfortable with, offer something which is interesting. It's, it's, it's really, at the end of the day, it's about the, the viewer, it's not about, not about you, but you've got to be authentic to yourself. Offer something that they can learn. They, they walk away, but they finish the video, they found it interesting and they learned something. What more can you do? Thank you so much, Gideon, for coming here today. Tell everybody, My pleasure. How, tell everybody how they can find you. Uh, yes, uh, let them talk TV. Do a little search into your YouTube search box and you'll find, find us there. Find me, Ross. <laughs> Great. Yeah, and we'll put all out. the links in the description. If you're watching or listening, go to the description. You'll find the links to Gideon's channel and his website. Thank you. And uh, Chris, thank you. And do check out the video that Chris and I made together. Oh, yeah. That was definitely. awesome. That was an awesome collaboration. So check that one out too. Uh, La uh, Accent Swap, American and British. Accent English. Swap. That was fun. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to English World with Chris Americos. Now it's your turn. Don't just listen to English, speak English with us every day. Join our English Everyday Speaking Program today. See you in the next episode. Bye-bye.